Ian is the National Hassan, and I get to be one of the pastors here. So thank you so much for being here, and I want to especially thank those of you who are watching online as well. Uh, and I especially want to thank all of you. If this is your first time being here this morning, thank you for coming. Uh, we welcome you to be here. I also want to highly encourage you to please fill out the digital connection card. Uh, on the, the back of a lot of these seats here, we have this QR code. If you wouldn't mind just scanning that, and then you can fill that information out, and we'll be able to contact you throughout the week. And I also want to highly encourage you to please, after the service, uh, go to our connection booth out in the courtyard. That way we can meet you face to face. Uh, hopefully, answer any questions that you may have, and then also give you a really cool restoration mug. I talk about that mug all the time. You gotta, you gotta get one if you're new here. All right, the coffee just tastes better in that. Mug. All right, amen. 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 You don't want to drink it like, man, I can't wait for church. All right, anyway, sorry. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for your giving. Your giving helps us to continue to share the gospel here in Homestead. and also helps us in other ways, too, to help serve our community. Uh, last, yesterday, actually, we had a funeral that was uh, hosted here in our church. It was a young man who passed away uh, suddenly, uh, only about 25 years old. Uh, and he was he had huge impacts here on a lot of the youth and young adults here in our uh, city of Homestead. So we were able to host that for him here. So I just want to let you know that your giving helps us be able to do that as well. Okay, so as you continue to give, I want to remind you that you can give either in the box in the back by the door, or you can give online at our website, or you can give via the app, or you can even text to give. And the number to text to give is above those QR codes on the back of the screen. All right, so today we're going to be continuing our sermon series titled Sent. In the past few weeks, we have discussed how we are to be sent in, uh, or how we are to, uh, we are sent to be bold in our witness. We are sent to be in fellowship with one another and to be devoted to the word. And while all this is absolutely true, there is also another aspect of this that we are going to look at this morning. And that is the posture in which propels us to be sent out. What state do we personally have to be in in order to be a, in order for us to be a witness in our community, in order for us to be sent out by our Lord and Savior? We're going to discuss that this morning. So, if you have your Bible or the Bible app, I would ask that you could please turn to Acts chapter nine. And we're going to be in verses one through nine. Acts chapter nine. Verse, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 9. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. We'll have the verses up on the screen as well. But again, I'm going to encourage you to please try to start reading your Bibles. I've been, we've been saying that for a long time. And today, you're really going to wish you brought it because I'm going all over the place in Acts. Okay? So anyway, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. If you're there, say a word. Word. Awesome. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, as we begin to dive into your word this morning, we just come before you with gratitude. Gratitude for your word that you give, up, give us your special revelation that we are able to know you and to know what you want from us as well. But we thank you for your word that we are able to see your hearts of mercy and compassion for us through it as well. Lord, I pray that as we go through it, that we are able to put aside anything that may be on our mind, anything that may be on our hearts, that may be uh, guarding us from hearing your word this morning. Help us to be able to put that aside, Lord, and speak to us through your word. Lord, we love you, and 
we thank you and we pray for all these things. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Okay, so, so far we have gone through the first six chapters of Acts, and we have seen how the early church was started and how it grew inside of the city of Jerusalem. Now today we've skipped a few chapters and we landed at chapter 9, but I want to recap a little bit of between chapter 6 through 8, because there's a lot of important stuff that happens in there as well. In chapter 6, which we discussed last week, seven men were appointed to help the elders and uh, to help the apostles oversee the church. One of these men, his name was Stephen, right? And Steve, Stephen is described as a man full of grace and full of power, and he was doing many wonders and signs among the people. But at the end of chapter 6, we see that Stephen gets arrested for his faith, and in chapter 7, they actually cast him out of the city, and they stone him. Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. And what is interesting is that when they're stoning him, it says that the witnesses lay down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So what this means is that this man Saul, he's the one he, who is approving of this execution of Stephen. And this leads to the other question, well, then who was Saul? Well, Saul, he was a Jew and a Pharisee, and he was a religious leader that, since his youth, had devoted his life to Judaism, right? He was a young leader who was very zealous for his religion, and the first time we see him is here at the stoning of Stephen, where he's actually giving the approval for this to happen. And then we get into chapter 8, and this is where we see that Saul does not stop with Stephen, in fact, he, he approves of his execution, but then he starts to go after all the Christians. Anyone that would bear the name Christian, anyone that professed that Jesus was the Messiah, Saul was hell-bent out to go and get them and to persecute them. Look at chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It says this, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation for him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So Saul, he executes Stephen, and then immediately he starts to begin to persecute the church as a whole. But you see it, you see it right there, it says that and there arose on that day, that same day that he, that he stoned Stephen, that on that day a great persecution rose against the whole church. And then in verse 3 it says that Saul was ravaging the church. The verb for ravaging here is levinomai, which in Psalms this verb means it's used when wild boars are tearing apart a vineyard. And it especially refers to when a wild animal is devouring a body. Just picture like a pack of vultures around a dead body in the street that we see all the time. You see how the vultures, they just ravage that body, they just pick it apart. And this is exactly what Saul was doing to the church. In fact, it says that he was going from house to house, dragging men and women out in order to put them into prison. Like, can you imagine that? Someone going from house to house, pulling out Christians in order to put them into prison. This ravaging was so bad, in fact, that it says that all were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem, but everyone else, they went out. And if you remember from last week, at this point, the church was in Jerusalem, right? And they had grown to about over 20,000 members, so it's a lot of people. Yet this persecution was so bad that it caused the whole church to get out of Jerusalem, and they start heading out through Judea and Samaria. And the way I try to picture this is, you know, when you, if, if you ever step on an ant pile, right, and you start seeing all the ants all of a sudden come out of nowhere, and they just, right, they're all over the place. That's how, that's how I picture the church here, while the impact of Saul's foot is stepping on their church. Well, Saul, being the religious extremist that he is, he's not pleased with the fact that everyone is getting out. Right? He wanted more. He wanted to get all of Christ's followers to pay for their faith, to pay for the claim of who Jesus is. And this is where we now get to chapter 9, where he's on his way to Damascus to 
try to catch up to some of these fleeing disciples. And we see that here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. It says this. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So look, it says that Saul, he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So look, Saul is so infuriated with the, his disciples that it's just like breathing out like these threats. He's breathing out this murder like it animates him. Like he is so upset about this. He's so enthralled in this. Like have you ever been so upset with somebody or something that your blood just boils and then you just get all hyped up and your eyes get really big like this and you just look crazy, right? Like that's how I, I see like this type of emotion that Saul is feeling right now towards the disciples. He feels so much anger, so much so that he has to go to the high priest, and he gets permission from him to go to Damascus, which was another city, and that if he was to find any belonging to the way, that he'd be able to bring them back to Jerusalem and put them in prison. Now, the way is what they called the early Christians at that time. They said that they belonged to the way, which could be a reference to what Jesus said in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But Saul gets his permission from the high priest, and he goes on and sits on a, about a week-long journey, roughly 150 miles, to go to Damascus in order to do this. Now, here's a question that I hope everyone's asking. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? Why is he so angry? Like, why does his blood boil so much at the Christians? Why is he on a mission to destroy God's people? Like, they're not hurting anybody. Right, they're not doing anything wrong, but why is he so bent on hurting them? Well, look, Saul, he was radical, and at this point, he's just a raving lunatic, right? But we also have to understand that he thought that he was actually doing the right thing. He thought that he was fighting for God. Remember, he was a Pharisee, and he was waiting for the Messiah himself, but he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Right? So he starts hearing that people are saying that Jesus is the Messiah, and now he's infuriated by that. He's like, how are you leading people away from God, and how are you following a false teaching and a false Messiah? He wanted to protect his God, and he had so much passion for the Lord that he actually thought that he was doing the right thing. But even as he's on his way to the Damascus, like I, can, I can just envision our sovereign Lord looking down on him. Knowing what he's about to go do, the Lord just knows. And the Lord is like, Man, that's not what I have planned for you, Saul. That's not what I have planned for you. And I think we can all relate with Saul in some sense. Because we've all had times when we've either done something or thought something or gone a route that we shouldn't have. Where we look back and we see that, hey, that actually wasn't the Lord guiding those steps. Right? That was me. <laughs> I did what I wanted to do. Right? But come to find out that wasn't the right thing to do. And we can easily try to make ourselves feel better by saying, oh, you know, the Lord wants me to do this. Or the Lord's telling me to do this. When in fact, we haven't really spent much time with the Lord on that decision at all. You, you haven't really spent the time to be still and listen. These are the times when we didn't really seek His instru instruction because quite frankly, we really didn't want His opinion on it. We really didn't want him to say anything because that might go against what we actually want to do. So we get caught up in the emotion of whatever's going on around us, and then we fool ourselves into thinking that we are doing the Lord's work when in fact we may actually be going against what he wants us to do. And even with all that said, the Lord has his ultimate plan for us individually. The Lord looks down on you, and he wants to use you. There's a certain thing that we have to do in order for the Lord to use us. In order for us to be a true witness of the one true God. In order to be sent out by our Lord and Savior himself. And to know where he is leading us, we must first surrender. What we will see today is that those who are sent out by God are those who have surrendered. As we continue in our passage, we're going to see three areas in which we need to fully surrender.
surrender to him if we are to be used by him. And the first one is this. In order to be sent, we must surrender our pride. In order to be sent, we must surrender our pride. Look at verses 3 through 5. It says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So look, Saul, he's on his way to Damascus. He's a man of authority in Israel. He's a man of rank, a man of prestige, a man who's on a mission to conquer these Christians. And all of a sudden, this man is now on the ground because the glory of the Lord has now shone around him so much so that it knocked him to the ground. And he hears, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Immediately, Saul knows that this is God. Immediately he knows this is God. And he says, who are you, Lord? And listen to the response. He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Here's where Saul realizes that he had actually been going against God rather than serving him. The same Jesus whom he fought so vehemently against by attacking his followers is the same Jesus whom he now calls Lord. See, Saul's story is very drastic, but I would argue that ours is not much difference. We may not have been killing Christians or attacking the church, and I hope not, really, right? But we definitely have had times in our life where we didn't acknowledge Jesus for who he actually is. Some of us used to think of him as just some good guy, right? Someone with good morals, someone good to follow, someone that we want our kids to get to know, right? Because it's good for them. Some of us here didn't even believe in him at all. But here's the thing. When we talk about surrendering our pride, that means that we are to follow Saul's example by saying that we were wrong, where we humble ourselves and acknowledge that Jesus is not just some good guy, not just somebody with good morals, not just somebody for our kids to follow, but he is the creator of all things, and he is king of kings, and he is Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah.
So Ananias, he hears this command from the Lord, and ultimately and immediately his guard comes up. Okay? Because he hears Saul from Tarsus. And he goes, wait a second. You know, did, did you just say Saul from Tarsus? <laughs> and then he responds by saying this. Like, look what he says. He says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. Like how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind all who call on your name. So Ananias is like, what? Like Saul from Tarsus? Are, are you serious right now? Like I know who that is. Like that's a bad dude. You know, but that's a bad dude. And actually I know why he's even here. He, he's coming here to arrest your followers and to persecute them and to murder them. Like are you sure we're talking about the same guy? Like you want me to go and see this lunatic? Because the reality is Ananias walking in to see Saul, like that's likely suicide. Ananias walking in to see Saul, that's most likely him getting arrested. He's going to get arrested for that. This is a guy that everyone's running away from. Like nobody's going and trying to visit Saul and have pound cake and coffee. Like nobody's trying to do that with Saul, right? So this is a big deal. And he brings it before God and he's like, are you sure, God? But listen to the Lord's response. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So I can just imagine Ananias there in shock of what he's being asked to do. In shock of who he's asked to go talk to. And at the same time, in this passage, we also witness that Ananias was able to surrender his fear of what was to come in order to be obedient to his Lord and Savior. Amen. That leads to our next point. In order to be sent, we must surrender our fears. In order to be sent, we must surrender our fears. Look at verses 17 through 19. It says, so Ananias departed, and he entered the house, and laying his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And verse 18 says this, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So right here we see Ananias, right? He's able to surrender his fear to the Lord. He puts his trust in the Lord and he departs. He leaves his house. He actually gets up and goes to do what the Lord has asked him to do. And he goes and he enters into this house where he now sees Saul, who has been raging threats against God's people. This man of authority, right? This man that was coming here to hurt everybody. And he sees Saul, but now he is blind. And he's fasting. And he's praying. And he's humbled before the Lord. Like, this is a different man already. And I want you to see what Ananias does. He says here, and laying his hands on him, he says, Brother Saul. Look, Ananias lays his hands on Saul, who was supposed to be feared. Right? This was a guy that everybody was running away from. Yet Ananias walks up to him and lays his hands on Saul. And then he addresses him as Brother Saul. And this is huge because this may be the first word that Saul hears from another Christian since his conversion. And it's not one of condemnation of, hey, this is what you were doing. You were hurting our people. It's not any of that, but it's actually one of warm welcome. Amen. Where Ananias calls him Brother even after all he's done to the church body, after all the people that he's hurt, he's still welcomed into the family. And then Ananias continues by saying this. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. So look, at the sound of Ananias' words, it says that immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and then he was able to see, right? And this is beautiful to see Saul's transformation into this new creation through Jesus Christ. But what I don't want you to miss is that because of the obedience of Ananias to listen to the Lord and because he surrendered his fears to the Lord, because he trusted the Lord's calling for him, 
He was sent. And he was used in order to help bring another man into the body of Christ so that he could call him brother. Because of Ananias' trust in the Lord, he was able to witness this happen. Like he was able to see God at work in the conversion of Saul. And he was able to be a part of something so amazing because he left his fear at the foot of the cross. And look, I know that in our Christian walk, there are many fears that we face. But I think that a lot of these boil down to a fear of missing out. I think a lot of us got FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Oh, if my friends know that I'm a devout Christian, they won't invite me to places. If they know that I believe in Jesus, they're going to exclude me. My family will push me away. I will be outside looking in. People won't involve me in their conversations. I'm going to miss out on things that are fun. Like, I'm going to miss out on being comfortable. And while all, things, all these things are true, right, they very, much, they very well may be the case. But what I want you to know, like what the real FOMO, the real fear of missing out for a Christian should be. What should every Christian fear missing out on? We should all fear missing out on seeing the Lord work through us. Yes. That's what we should fear missing out on. And let me tell you something. Like a lot of people, right, they want to see God work in their life. Then they get frustrated uh, because they don't see or experience the Lord work in their life. They don't, they don't see it. But listen, it's, it's extremely difficult for the Lord to work through you if you don't surrender your fears and all of these things and trust in the Lord. When you surrender your fears of missing out on worldly things or fears of what people may say about you or what they may do to you, when you surrender those fears, that's when the Lord can use you. Amen. Because you are ready to get up and go. Mm -hmm. And Ananias, he was, he was able to be a part of this conversion of Saul. He saw it, he experienced it because he trusted the Lord. If he would have said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not going there. Like, I'm scared to do that. Then he would have missed out on something. My question to you is, are you letting fear stop you from obeying the Lord? Are you letting fear stop you from obeying the Lord? Is your fear of serving, is your fear of talking to other people, is your fear of sharing the gospel, is all those things stopping you from obeying the Lord? Because if so, you're missing out on what the Lord can do for you. And I don't want you to miss out. And lastly, there's one more thing in this passage that we must surrender. It's this. In order to be sent, we must surrender our mission. In order to be sent, we must surrender our mission. So Saul, he comes into Damascus with this mission to destroy the church, right? To hurt the Christians, to bring them back in chains to Jerusalem. He was fully prepared to do this, and he was hungry to do so. But what we see is that when he gets hit with the reality that he was actually persecuting Jesus himself, that he was actually persecuting the Messiah, the Son of God, when he realizes he had no choice but to surrender this mission that he was on, that, that mission was over as soon as he hit the ground. And us in the same way when we are knocked to the ground, when we realize who Jesus is, that he is God, that he did come down from heaven to die on the cross in order to save us from our sins. And three days later, he rose from the grave. And now those who put their faith in him are now declared right with God and inherit eternal life. Like when we realize this, when we are in this state, we also drop our fleshly mission that we have been on. Amen. Because before coming to Christ, each of us... <laughs> That our own mission to please our own desires of our flesh and of our hearts. But our mission was our own pleasure. Our mission was for ourselves. We had a mission of self. And the truth is, even as believers, we still struggle with this. Right? We still find ourselves only concerned with me, myself, and I. But that's why we need to continue to surrender our pride and recognize who Jesus is. Because when we are sure of who Jesus is, our mission changes. We take on a new mission where our old mission was to live by our own conscience and our own flesh. Our new mission is surrendered to the pride and we surrender our fear and we put our trust and faith into Jesus Christ in order that we may share his good news to everyone. In order that we may be sent out to be a witness of 
Jesus Christ. And that's actually what we see here in Acts 9 with Saul. That's exactly what happened with Saul. The mission that he had on his way to Damascus, that's over. That was over for good. And then he took on this new mission. Look at verses 19 through 22. It says, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? And then look at verse 22. It says, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. You see, immediately he proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God. Immediately. And then people were amazed and they're also confused because they're like, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> they're confused. Right? But Saul, he continues to get stronger and he continues to get wiser. And he, all he did was set out to prove that Jesus was the Christ. And this became his new mission. And he became devoted to it. And now Saul, he's also known in the New Testament by the name of Paul, right? And he ends up being so influential to the, to the start of the church, right? And, he, and the rest of Acts actually records him going on three missionary journeys as he goes and plants churches in different places. And then as he does this, he's also met with much suffering, with many imprisonments, many trials and near-death experiences, until ultimately he was killed for his faith and his witness in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul was used this way because he understood his mission was now the mission that God had planned. It wasn't his own mission anymore. He surrendered his own mission to take this one on, and he was used by the Lord drastically because of it. If we are to be used by God in big ways, we must surrender our worldly mission that's based around our own self-pleasures and our own selfish desires. And as we surrender our mission of self, we must take off the mission that the Lord has prepared. As we close this morning, I want you to realize that if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you bear his name, he wants to use you. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you bear his name, he wants to use you. So many people come up to me saying stuff like, man, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm shy, I, I can't speak well, I'm introverted, you know, uh, I don't think God has a place for me to do something here, you know. But then a lot of times I also hear people dealing with, like, guilt and shame, saying stuff like, dude, if you only knew my past, if you only knew my past, you wouldn't know that God can't use me. Like, if you knew the stuff that I have done, you wouldn't tell me that God would use me because he can't. If this is you today, burdened by your past sins, thinking that God won't use you because of them, you need to realize that if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then those past sins are paid for. Yeah. They are paid for on the cross by Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that God shows you grace. Yes, if God shows you grace, not because you deserved it, but because he loves you. Yeah. And he died. Amen. And then you also need to think about this guy, Saul. Right? That we talked about today. He was a murderer. Right? He was a murderer. Not just a murderer, but he was a murderer of God's people. Right? Yet God still showed him unending grace and used him in miraculous ways. And he goes on to write 13 books in the New Testament. And 2,000 years later, we are still here leaning on his teachings. So don't ever believe that God cannot choose you because that is a lie from the devil. Yeah. Because he can use you. In the scriptures, he uses all types of people. Moses, he had a hard time speaking, public speaking. And you look at what he did with Moses. Like, we, he uses all people. But here's the thing, that they all have in common. They all surrender to him. Amen. Today we talked about surrendering our pride, our fear, and our mission before the Lord. But what I want you to realize is that all of these things really have to deal with selfishness. They all have to deal with love of self. With self-preservation, self-desire, self-exaltation, all about self. So to sum everything up this morning, it all boils down to this. In order to be sent, we must surrender ourselves before the Lord. In order to be sent, we must surrender ourselves 
before the Lord, knowing that we are no longer our own, but we were bought with a price. And because of that, we are humble before him as Lord and Savior. And our fears are cast before him, and the mission is to do his will and not our own. We surrender ourselves because Jesus first surrendered himself to us. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that, that while Saul was on this road to Damascus, like I pictured the Lord looking down on him and saying, that's not what I have planned for you, Saul. That's not what I have planned for you. And I think all of us should contemplate today whether or not he may be looking at you the same way. I see what track you're on. It's not what I have planned for you. My prayer today is that we all have FOMO. Right? Fear of missing out on God working through us. I pray that for our congregation, like all of us together, like we will fear to miss out on seeing God work through us. Where it's like, Lord, I want to be obedient to you. Not just because I have to where you're going to hurt me. No, Lord, I want to be obedient to you because I've seen what you have done for me. And Lord, I want to be obedient to you because I want you to use me. Send me. Lord, I want to see you work in my life. I want to see people come to faith by you using me. I want to see people hear your gospel by you using me as a vessel. Like, Lord, send me. Lord, I want to be used. Lord, I just pray that for all of us that we have a fear of missing out on that. Hallelujah. But we want to see people come to faith and be able to call them brothers and sisters. But we want to see God do miraculous things here in Homestead. But we want him to use us. If this is what you want to see, church family, if this is what you want to see, say amen. Amen. Church family, I'm going to say it again. If this is what you want to see, say amen. Amen. If this is what you want, we must surrender our lives to him. Because in order to be a people who are sent, we must be a people who are surrendered. Let us pray. Oh, Lord. You are so good to us. Or even as we walk through this passage and we, we understand we need to surrender our whole self to you, knowing that our life is no longer our own, because you paid for us, that you adopted us into your family, and that we are sons and daughters. Lord, help us to surrender everything to you. Help us to surrender our pride. Help us to understand who you truly are, because when we need to understand who you are and what you've done for us, it makes surrendering everything else that much easier. Lord, help us to fear missing out on you working through us. Lord, help us to have a hunger and a desire for you to work through us individually. Lord, help us to want that more than anything to where we say, Lord, I just want you to use me so badly. Lord, all I want is for you to use me. Lord, help us have that as a constant prayer every morning as we surrender our pride, the next thing we say is, Lord, use me. Open doors for me to spread your word. Lord, help us to put our fears aside and help us to step in obedience. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And all God's people said,